What is the true African story? And how can Africans tell their true story in a smart way? Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you from Shanghai, where the first ever international forum on media cooperation was held among professionals and experts and scholars from developing countries. I had the pleasure to sit down with Kwasi Pratt, founder of Pan-African Television, to find out his answers to these important questions. Kwasi, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us about your institution, the Pan-African Television. Why did you set it up together with other people and what is your aim? Well, we actually have been trying to, to develop the media, you know, as part of our effort to tell the true African story. And this dates back 40 years ago, you know. First of all, we started producing a newspaper on Stiko Stalin machine, stencil, rolling it by hand and so on. And then eventually in 1991 or thereabout, we established a formal newspaper, The Insight. And we had ambitions, you know, to go into television and radio. And television became a reality seven years ago. And the main objective is to let people tell their own stories, you know, based on their own understanding of their history and their present, and to make people dream. I've been involved in broadcasting since 1969. And there were many things that I didn't understand. I mean, the makeup and so on, you know, the artificial arrangements and so on. I always wanted to see people in their natural environment being themselves and expressing themselves. And that's the ambition. We haven't reached there yet, but hopefully we'll get there one day. What is the true African story? The true African story dates back many years ago, 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. The days of Akintin, Imhotep, and so on, that's about two to 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. The African story is a story of slavery, the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. It's a story of classical colonialism, and today it's a story of neocolonial exploitation, disguised colonialism. The African story is also a paradox, a paradox of so much riches, in the midst of so much poverty. That's the African story. The African story is also a story of friendships, friendships around the world. The friendship between the founder of the Republic of Ghana, President Nkrumah, and the Prime Minister of China, Xu Wenlai. That's an African story. The African story is a struggle for Pan-Africanism. The African story is also a struggle for building a new world without war and without poverty. A new world in which children don't go to bed on, bed on empty stomachs and so on. So the African story is diverse and complex. How do you tell this true African story? What do you do in your daily TV production, for instance, or newspaper articles that is different from the other ways that are not telling the true African stories? One of the ways is take the camera into the streets, take the camera into the villages, mm. take the camera to where the people are in their own habitat, where the people live, where they work, and where they enjoy life, and to let the people express themselves. That's the true African story. It is not the story of heads of states. It is not the story of emperors. It is not the story of parliamentarians, it's the story of the real people who farm, who drive the commercial vehicles, the real people who do the construction, the real people who are affected by the ravages of our history. What do these people say? What do they want, for instance, from all these years of covering their stories and listening to them where they are? Is there one example that you can share with us that can best tell that what they want to tell or what they aspire in life is not what is being expressed in, in the, the, uh, the old ways of telling the African story. 
Journalism has taught me one thing, that all people are the same, and all people have the same aspirations. Which are? All people everywhere want to protect themselves from the ravages of the weather. They need good housing. All people everywhere do not want to fall sick. They need to prevent diseases. And when they fall sick, they want to be cured. All people want to eat well. All people want to feel human. And that's the nature of our common humanity. So, yes, African people may be different in some ways, cultural expressions, even that is doubtful. African people may look different, but we all have the same aspirations. And that's the point we constantly have to make to the world, a world full of racism, a world full of discrimination, a world full of hatred. We need to build a new world based on love. How difficult, how challenging has it been, this journey? Has this journey been? It's extremely difficult. Because over many years, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years and so on, we have built prejudices. And these prejudices always serve as a block to realizing the true human spirit. The true human spirit of freedom, of liberty and so on. The true human spirit, which abhors exploitation and oppression in all, all its forms. It is our prejudice which is a problem, and we need to overcome that prejudice. And the only way to overcome that prejudice is to expose the reality of the African people, and indeed, the reality of all people. Hmm. Can you give an example? Uh, a recent story that your TV produced, for instance, that tells the the true story of Africa. Is there any story that you can think of for now at this moment? We do not have the ambition to tell extraordinary stories. Mm -hmm. Our ambition is to tell ordinary everyday stories. Yeah. You understand? I did an interview with a woman who actually makes plantain chips. And when she went through her experiences, it explained the African condition. It explained the the, the inequality in our society. It explains the hardships that people have to go through and to explain also the kind of society in which we live, in which we have a filthy rich and the abominable poor and so on. So every story, you know, exemplifies a real situation and the real situation of inequality, a real situation of exploitation and a real situation of limitations on the realization of the aspirations of our people. Where are the solutions? The solutions lie, first of all, in thinking, and secondly, in acting. Mm -hmm. We have to challenge all the stories we've been told over the years. We've been told over the years that if we want to develop, we have to copy the West, okay? Nobody tells us that the West got to the stage in which it is today through the transatlantic slave trade, through the conquest of people, through colonialism, and through today's neocolonialism. Now, for us as African people, for us living in Ghana, we don't have the means and even the opportunity to enslave other people. For us living in Africa, we don't have the opportunity, the means, and even the morality to impose colonialism on other people. So that part to development is not available to us as a people. Our only part to development lies in self-reliant development and friendship with those who understand us. Mm. You talk about neo-colonialism. Uh, you mentioned it twice already. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because in, if you read what is being said on some international media, that means China. <laughs> they say China is trying to colonize Africa in a, under disguise of economic cooperation. So what do you see as real neocolonialism? Well, that kind of, of explanation is it's difficult to understand. Well, first of all, China has not dropped bombs on any territories anywhere in the world. Uh, in the effort to steal the resources of those territories. China has not done that. 
China did not uh, capture Africans to use as beasts of burden for hundreds of years. China's attitude has been genuine friendship with the African people and indeed with all the peoples all over the world. In our most difficult periods, we counted on China. We stood shoulder to shoulder with China in combating racism even in its worst form of apartheid. Yeah. The National Liberation Movement in Africa enjoyed considerable support from China and so on. So China is a friend. China is a brother. And China's understanding of Africa is not based on a hierarchical structure of masters and servants. It's based on a structure of mutual friendship and the development of the entire world for the prosperity of all the peoples of the world. So what do you see as the problem today when you say new uh, exploitation or new colonialism? Because you did mention it. Do you think there is a new form of exploiting African people, African countries that are done by, by, by some forces or riches, I don't know, capital in the world today? For many years, hundreds of years, our destiny was shaped, one, by the kind of education that all of us had, an education system which, which implanted in us a sense of inferiority. For many years, we were told that we couldn't do anything on our own and that we had to copy others. I went to school many years ago. I went to primary school many years ago. Only recently, I visited the school that I went to and found out that what I was taught is exactly what is being taught today in that school. Like? For example, we were made to sing songs, you know, as part of our instruction. And I went to the school that I went to, and they're still singing, London's burning, London's burning, fire, fire, no water. What has London burning got to do with the peasants in Ghana? What has London burning got to do with the working class elements struggling for improvements in the conditions of work and conditions of life and so on? So this type of education has planted in us a huge sense of inferiority. We've got to change that in order to get out of this whole system hmm, of the slave and his master. We've got to teach our people the great African stories of architecture, of engineering, of medicine, and so on. We've got to develop confidence in ourselves, and we've got to realize that we can become masters of our own destiny. Neocolonial exploitation finds expression in different forms. One of the means of perpetuating neocolonialism today is the prescriptions which are fed us by the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Every now and then has become cyclical. We run into difficulties, we are unable to pay our debts and we go to them for solutions. What solutions do they give us? Freeze employment in the public sector. Devalue your national currency. Dismantle state enterprises. Withdraw subsidies on social services and so on. And it makes our situation worse. So in five years, we go back to the same institutions and they give us the same prescriptions. That's a problem. Do you have numbers or um, support? you know, evidences to substantiate the statement that you just made, for instance, the per capita GDP or, or whatsoever, because the IMF, the World Bank, actually I just met a, a representative executive from the World Bank, they're also trying to help, you know, they're also, however divided they may be, however, you know, tr traditional in their approach, they also try to bring development to the world, but you're saying with their help, actually the situation has not got, gotten better, can you substantiate that? As a matter of fact, what we're getting from them is not help. The purpose for the establishment is to ensure the integrity of Western financial institutions. Simple. So what they're offering us comes in the guise of help, but it's actually to strengthen Western financial institutions. Okay. Right now, as we speak, I come from Ghana. 
And Ghana now needs 120% of its total national revenue to service debt, repay debt, and to pay public sector workers. We are broke. We go to the IMF, what do they offer us? $3 billion loans. Loans that we have to pay. With interest. Of course, loans that we have to pay. That is not a solution. Especially when the loans come with conditions which undermine our development. For example, one of the conditions is a freeze on public sector employment. What does that mean? The teeming young people who are unemployment now have no hope of gaining employment in the public sector. Now, development need not be assessed with statistical averages. The statistical averages can always lie. What does GDP mean? What does per capita income mean? And you're talking about per capita income. You are putting the incomes of everybody together and dividing it by the mean. Right. Okay. So in one year, if 1% of the population huh, get a 1,000% increase in their incomes and 99% of the population get no increase at all, per capita rises. So per capita income doesn't tell the whole story. So what tells the story and how, where is the solution? How do you see is the solution? The story is told by the real life of the people. When you live in an economy where a person's daily minimum wage cannot buy a bottle of beer. Is that the reality in That's some parts the reality of, in in some most part, of Africa? In most of Africa. When you live in a situation where a person's minimum wage cannot buy a bottle of beer, cannot buy a square meal, cannot, when people cannot, workers cannot afford transportation to work and back home, then there's a crisis. And that is the measurement. It is not per capita income. It is not the gross national product. Mm -hmm. It is not the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. The life of the people tells the story. I get your point. Um, I don't want to try to fish for compliments for China, <laughs> because, but I do want to know what do you think of China's proposals, China's initiatives, for instance, China is investing a lot, both from the government and Chinese enterprises, you know, building projects, building infrastructure. Um, I do not know, unfortunately, the specific Chinese presence in Ghana, but what do you think of that? The pros and cons, if you, if you if you can share with us. Well, first of all, we have to understand that we are discussing this within the context of an anti-Chinese hysteria. Yes. Which is deliberately fueled by Western government, Western intelligence agencies, and their media. There's a vigorous anti-Chinese hysteria. That's the backdrop. What is the reality? What is the reality? The reality is simple. I don't know any time in our history that the Chinese intelligence services and government overthrew an African government. I don't know of any instance in our history where Chinese assistance to Africa or any other country has been dependent on the people's choice of a type of government. And so that's the difference. Mm. You understand? The West pretends to be giving us aid but it's always conditioned on many things. Conditioned on the type of government you have, the system of government you have, who is in power and who is not in power, and so on. So many conditions that in the final analysis, you are constricted by this aid. You understand? Right now, if you look at the conflict, for example, between Russia and Ukraine, of course, we know that the conflict is not between Russia and Ukraine. The conflict is about resistance to NATO's domination of that part of the world, okay? But it is interpreted as a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Right now, you cannot get access to Western finances. You cannot get access to Western aid unless you declare support for NATO's oppression in Ukraine and against Moscow's actions in Ukraine. So we are not free. 
And this so-called aid ties us down, you know. It makes us followers of sometimes the very unreasonable policies of the West and so on. It is not so with China. You understand? I mean, we belong to the British Commonwealth. Ghana belongs to the British Commonwealth. Ghana now has joined the Francophonie, which is an association of former French colonies and so on. It has not in any way obstructed our relations with China. That's the difference. You don't have to sing the praises of China in order to benefit from Chinese assistance. You can be independent and still benefit from Chinese assistance. That's the difference. So basically you're saying, although the colonial days are gone, although the Cold War is over, but the mentality of the previous masters and the mentality of some educators, you know, in, in Africa, for instance, or in other parts of the world, have not changed. They have not gone out of that era. Blatant, in-your-face colonialism is gone. What we have is subtle colonialism. And I'll illustrate that. If you take the relief map of any former colony, especially Ghana, what do you find? In Ghana, you find that all the railway lines start from areas of concentration of wealth, where we have bauxite, where we have timber, where we have diamond, where we have gold, and so on. They start from there, and where do they end up? They end up in the ports. Okay? So the whole development orientation is to take out wealth. That's the whole development orientation, and the railway lines tell the story adequately okay why if you're going to develop railway lines we need to develop railway lines between areas of concentration of material and areas where these materials are transformed in order to ease the lives of our people that's not our situation today you understand you look at european union rules and it's crazy you know rules based on, on origin of goods and so on, it's crazy. You understand? You look at, for example, the, the economic partnership agreement with the EU, and it says that we cannot discriminate against, in any way, against companies originating from Europe. It doesn't make sense. We ought to be able to decide for that for these products for which we have comparative advantage, we are not going to allow imports from Europe. Finished. Every country should have the right to decide that. We are not allowed to decide that. If you take the example of former French colonies, okay, all of them have no option but to deposit their foreign reserves in the Central Bank of France. So at the end of the day, they borrow their own money and pay interest on borrowing their own money to France. It simply doesn't make sense. So this paradigm ought to change. A paradigm which frees us from these imposed obligations. A paradigm which makes us masters of our own destiny. And that's the paradigm we're struggling for. It's been an uphill battle for you, I understand, to build an African voice from Africa, by Africa, through the Pan-African TV. People with like-minded ideas, you know, like-minded people. What can, what can people do together, including from China, from other developing countries that have similar history, to, to help resolve these problems together? First of all, we have to be realistic and we have to work within the scope of what is available today. I mean, you cannot build CNN today. No. The resources are not available. The British, for example, spend up to six billion pounds a year financing the operations around the world. We don't have that kind of money. So we start with what we have and we grow. And we grow with solidarity. Solidarity of other media houses around the world that are trying to do what we're trying to do. And we grow with also learning from the mistakes of the big established media. We grow because we speak the truth. 
We grow because we belong to the people yeah. and the people consider us as them. Yeah. That's the only trick. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the mistakes we have to avoid? Exaggerations. 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 They distort reality. You understand? The mistakes we have to avoid is the presumption that we, the educated urbanite people, know better than the uneducated rural people. It is their story which is important, not our pretensions. We are not their teachers. We learn from them, as they are the people who are directly involved in producing the things that we need to make this world a better place. You are here in Shanghai to participate in a Global South Communication Forum. Um, what have you taken away from this forum and what, do, what more do you think can be done? Well, first of all, is the realization that all of us face the same problem. And all of us face the same problem of distortion of our reality. That all of us are anxious to tell our true story. What can be done is to develop a framework for meaningful cooperation for the media houses of the South, representing the people of the South. There are media houses in the South which are voices of the oppressor. That's not the kind of media I'm talking about. I'm talking about the media for liberation, the media for the emancipation of our people. And this media in the South ought to be talking together, ought to be acting together, and ought to be dreaming together in order to make a change. What is the future that you envision you know, the relationship, for instance, between the global north and the global south or the western countries, the former oppressors or the oppressors now today. How do you envision that? Uh, right now there is a competition going on. There is an effort to, to keep their dominance, right? We are trying to fight to have our voices heard. But what do you see? In the long term, we ought to be able to pull down this dichotomy of a global north and a global south. In the long term, we should have one group of working people struggling to improve their conditions together. In the long term, we ought to have a world without a bomb. In the long term, we ought to have a world which is focused on the prosperity of our people. And how to get there is through? Cooperation, talking together, appreciating our reality. And as Che Guevara would say, making love the center of everything. Thank you very much, Kwasi Prat, founder of Pan African Television. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Kwasi Prat, founder of Pan African Television. With that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you from Shanghai, where the first ever international forum was held to discuss media cooperation among developing countries. I'm Li Xin. As usual, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point.